welcome to this week in Missouri politics from our studios here on the campus of the University of Central Missouri at Warrensburg. And we are joined by one of the leaders in the Missouri Senate, Senator Greg Rays from Kansas City. Welcome back to the show. Hey. Good to see you, Scott. I should say Kansas City via the Boot Hill, right? Because we claim you a little bit too. But you know, I got a little Boot Hill boy still <laughs> left in me, Pemiscott County. So uh, big, big year in the Senate. A uh, lot of lot of things happened, but you know, a lot of things I think you probably were okay with didn't happen. Let's start with the the federal money. You guys had a bunch of the the capital always had this theory. The air's fresher at the capital. The pizza's fresher at Air's Pizza. The 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 flowers are prettier when you have money in the budget. You guys had a lot of money in the budget. Tell me about some stuff you brought home to Kansas City. You know, Scott, I think what we did with the budget this year uh, is unfortunately the second biggest story of session, uh, but the most important in reality. We really reinvested in Missouri. Uh, in Kansas City, you know, we, we appropriated $40 million to rebuild the dental school. The only public mm -hmm. dental school in the state of Missouri is at UMKC. Uh, $40 million, that building is nearly 60 years old. Uh, it's time for a new one. Uh, we've got money in the budget to try to help bring businesses from Europe into uh, the state of Missouri. Uh, I went on a trip to Dublin and London with the governor uh, trying to recruit businesses. Uh, we are investing in that infrastructure because that's our number one selling point is our location, mm -hmm. not just in the United States, but in North America. Uh, we have uh, the continent's two great rivers run through and meet here. Isn't it amazing? I hear some people sometimes talk about, well, you can't invest in infrastructure. I'm like, it would be like Las Vegas outlawing poker chips or Florida not dredging beaches. I mean, the idea of Missouri not investing in infrastructure, and that's roads and bridges and airports yep. and ports on our rivers. It, it is nearly uh, criminal not to be investing in infrastructure in Missouri. I mean, that is the, the uh, you know, Texas has oil, right? Yep. You know, there, Florida has all these wonderful beaches, but the natural resource we have is our central geographic location. A hundred percent. The rest of the session, a uh, little eventful, but you know what? Not as eventful as I think some folks had in mind, but the Senate, it ended, um, it ended uh, without a PQ, which mm -hmm. I thought was a, a testament, not just to the Republicans, but to the minority party as mm -hmm. well. Um, tell me about the Senate that you left and the Senate you might hope to show up to in January? Scott, I think you know me well enough to know that I believe in our form of government. And even as a member of the minority party, I still believe in it. See, it's easy to be a big fan of the system when you're in the super majority. When the super minority, that tests if you really are a fan of the system. I am a fan of the system. And as a Democrat, the dysfunction we saw within the Republican majority, mm -hmm. stopped a lot of things that I think are bad from passing. And from, yeah. that, and from that aspect, like that's great. What was upsetting is that we agree on what 90% of the stuff, a lot of what we do in the Senate are nuts and bolts yeah. parts of governing. And we weren't able to do a lot of that this year. Uh, so what I saw was our form of government breakdown. So what I hope to walk into next year is a Senate that functions like the Senate. Where we what take, if that functionality means things you're passionately against get passed? Uh, I think that functionality means that we have a seat at the table, uh, that we compromise, that Missourians understand that compromise isn't a bad word. Uh, there are going to be some things that pass that I don't like. Uh, hopefully, I can garner enough respect that things that I really want to stand up against I have the ability to stand up against. You didn't have to stand up and fight for Congressman Cleaver's district on the floor. That was an interesting thing I thought. No, no real serious version was brought to the floor of the Senate that would have drawn him out. And while it would have been for some very gangly looking districts throughout the state, I mean, there were people that had a, a plan to draw him out, but you were able to guess, uh, hold fast and keep the fifth, uh, what should be a Democrat seat for the next 10 years? Yeah, you know, I mean, the, the plan I saw had Kansas City, downtown Kansas City and Branson in the same congressional yeah. district. And, you know, we have the Kauffman Center for Performing Arts and there's great theaters in Branson, but not sure we have a lot in common. Mm -hmm. um, that was just gerrymandering at its worst. It was not serious. Uh, I think there's always gerrymandering, right? No matter what, keeping the fifth Democrats as element gerrymandering, but but sometimes, I mean, drawing a map is gerrymandering. That would have made very little sense for the people there. Oh, absolutely, and it wouldn't made sense for the people in Branson either. Exactly. I mean, it didn't make sense for anybody. Uh, so at the end of the day, it took 
you know, till the 11th hour, uh, but we got <laughs> a map passed that is a reasonable map. And you didn't have to break the Senate to do it. And we didn't have to break the Senate to do it. Let's talk about something. Um, the last time we were in these studios, uh, I was driving over with my son and I was listening to you filibuster a bill. Um, when the filibuster, when the bill's brought up on Thursday, you know that maybe um, you have some friends giving you a little bit of advantage in the Senate. Thursday's day, you all go home. Yep. You took to the floor for four or five hours. I know that I listened to it for an hour before I left, and you weren't done by the time I had got to Warrensburg from Jeff City. Um, and it was about a bill about transgender students. Yeah. Currently, they're six, eight, ten, maybe uh, biological males that want to play sports with, with females. Um, what, you had some strenuous opposition to that. Walk me through your opposition to that bill. Scott, I think if you look back 30 or 40 years ago, and this is, my filibuster was really about LGBT history, because mm -hmm. it's not something that's taught in schools. And I had no idea it was as tied to Kansas City as it was. And it's it was very it. tied to Kansas yeah. City. But if you look back just in our lifetime, and where I grew up in Pemiscott County, you know it well, or whether you live in St. Louis or Kansas City, 40 years ago, there's no way I could win a state Senate seat as a gay man. 40 even in the Democrat Party, right? Even in the yep. Democratic Party. 40 years ago, you know, people really hated gay, yep. gay people. Mm -hmm. What happened over the years is a lot of people like me came out in places like Cooter, Missouri. And a lot of families started to learn, hey, gay people aren't these terrible folks that we always thought they were. And what we're seeing now is transgender people have always existed. You can go back and look in different cultures, Native American history, they've always been there. Society's gotten to the point where it's okay to say it publicly. And the backlash that people like me faced 40, 50 years ago is now what transgender kids are facing this is today. This too personal. I'd never, I'd never ask you a question to offend you, but it almost makes me embarrassed to the part of the state I'm from in the Boot Hill. My assumption is one of the reasons that you used to live in the Boot Hill and now live in Kansas City and choose to live in Kansas City is probably some of those issues. May have developed, maybe that, that tolerance developed quicker in a place like Kansas City than it did in Cooter. Scott, I've said this on the Senate floor. Uh, and I hate this, and I, I love my mom for it at the same time. When I came out to her, one of her, I was a student at Mizzou, one of the very first words that came out of her mouth was never move back here. Not because she didn't want me nearby. She loved you. She loved me. She wanted me to be happy, and more importantly, she wanted me to be safe. Mm -hmm. And I worry about those kids in places like Cooter, who aren't happy and who aren't safe and who may harm themselves. And while this bill focuses on maybe four kids that want to run track and field in junior high, it is much bigger than that. It is, it is the state government telling them, you're not who you say you are. And it's okay to not understand who a transgender person is. It's new to most people. I encourage people to like reach out. I would reckon there may be 5% of the public of this state have that actually knows a person who's openly transgender. Yes. It's very hard to understand something that you have no frame of reference of. A hundred percent. But interesting, I think there's some folks, I've watched people use, I've watched Republicans use homophobic trends, homophobic statements, homophobic ad campaigns to further the Republican party in the past. I do think there is a difference in this issue. I think there's some folks that have an honest belief that it's not fair for a boy to grow up 17, 18 years as a, as a boy and then decide he wants to play other girl sports who've grown up as girls their whole life. There's some inherent advantages you would have, which is why they're separate sports to start with. Speak to the issue of fairness there. So for one thing, uh, we have a state organization that handles mm -hmm. fairness and competition issues. Uh, I don't think they've been consulted on this, but they do have a policy. And what their policy says is you can't just be 17. And let's be clear about this. A 17-year-old boy can't show up and put on a wig one day and say, I want to play in the girls' sport. Mm -hmm. That's not how it works. Uh, that's insulting to transgender people. Um, there is, is it a, fair for Michigan to have to make this decision? Is it reasonable for the General Assembly 
95% of which have mm. never really studied it yeah. to create a law banning something they don't understand. What would you say to a guy, and I bet you know some folks like this, this person is not out looking for, he's not looking to be conversational, he's not writing mm -hmm. homophobic Facebook posts, yeah. but he, he, he looks at this, he's, maybe he's a live and let live kind of guy, and he thinks that's not fair for my daughter. What do you say to him? You know, I, I, I understand that. I would encourage that person to meet a trans kid and to mm -hmm. talk to them. And you know, my, one of my favorite books is To Kill a Mockingbird. And you know, love that scene where Atticus says to Scout, sometimes you gotta walk around in someone else's skin. Let's just all take a deep breath and remember we're talking about a handful of kids. What are we not talking about? How many schools in this state mm -hmm. this week had to shut their doors and lock them because a trans kid wanted to play sports? Zero. How many had to shut their doors and lock them because there was a 19-year-old ready to murder children? Eight. Eight had to do that in Jackson County this week. How many teachers are we losing because a trans kid wants to play sports? Zero. How many are we losing because of low pay and issues like people bringing guns in? We're hemorrhaging students. Can't find substitutes. Why are we so focused on going after a handful of kids that we admit we don't understand yeah. when we have real issues that we need to focus on. And if you look, Senator Blunt, who I have plenty of disagreements with, but he's always been a champion for mental health, mm -hmm. in the gun compromise bill that they're looking at in the U.S. Senate, he provides money to law enforcement agencies to help with red flag laws. Four, maybe five senators, state senators, sent him a letter saying don't do that. The same ones that preached all year, why aren't we talking about 15 year olds that want to run track and field? Um, I, I, this is an issue that people need to take a deep breath and we need adults in the room to figure out what's right to do. In January, uh, uh, Caleb Brown did a piece in the Missouri Times said that's, this bill will be one of the first things he wants to pass. Is there a way to craft a policy here that you could live with? Yes, and I've presented several versions of that. Um, again, I think you know me well enough yeah. that I'm, I am no left-wing radical. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that kids in this state who are different don't feel like I felt when I was a teenager. Sure. I have that responsibility, uh, and I'm going to stand up for them. Senator Greg Razor, hope as the session gets close, we can come talk about that plan on this week in Missouri politics. Absolutely. We'll be right back. Mark Alford, leading candidate for Congress, joins us after this. I'm Dave Schatz. Digging trenches probably isn't your dream job, but it was ours. It's a dirty job, but it needs doing. When times got tough, with a lot of prayer and a lot of hard work, and we rescued our family's dream. We didn't focus on fixing blame. We focused on fixing problems. It's what America needs. Blue collar businessmen who will roll up their sleeves and get the job done. I'm Dave Schatz, and I approve this message. Because to fix America, we don't need more talkers. We need more doers. But as a former sheriff, it alarms me to see some of the attitudes towards those who have taken an oath to defend our communities and keep us safe. We must learn from the failed policies in other cities and states to never allow anti-law enforcement measures to take hold in this state. We must work to strengthen our communities by supporting our men and women in law enforcement. In Missouri, we defend law enforcement, not defund them. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople, while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right-to-work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. Your energy needs are changing. That's why at Ameren, Missouri, we're not waiting on the future. We're building it with the Smart Energy Plan, advancing thousands of projects across the state. 
helping reduce emissions through cleaner energy sources, boost reliability with self-healing equipment, and better withstand storms with new composite poles. Moving Missouri forward and bringing us all a little closer together. That's energy at work. Ameren, Missouri. Welcome back to Luke and Missouri Politics. We are joined by a man at the center of one of the hottest congressional primaries in the state, Mark Alford. Welcome to This Week in Missouri Politics. Thank you, Scott. Good to see you. Glad to have you. All right, so tell me, the background for you is you're an a anchor in, out of Fox in Kansas City, right. local Western Missouri guy. Tell folks about yourself past that. Well, I've been in the media for 35 years, 35 long years. I knew since I was in fifth grade that I wanted to be a professional communicator. I grew up in the rice fields and oil patch of Southeast Texas. My dad was a special Texas Ranger and an ag teacher. And I just had this hankering to tell stories. And that's what I did. I covered yeah. politics in the Texas State Capitol. Always loved politics, but always loved telling the stories of people and mm -hmm. how they made a difference in our society. And so I did that for many years and became an anchor, anchored for 23 and a half years at Fox 4 in Kansas City. But about 15 years ago, I, I read a book by Bernard Goldberg entitled Bias. Have you ever read that? I have two copies of it in my uh, office. It just opened my eyes. Yeah. I thought, I, this is what's going on in mm -hmm. our, our world today, in our media, the inherent bias from the mainstream media and how they're trying to affect the minds of the people, the viewers, and in turn politics. And so I began looking at everything in our station, in our scripts, and being a lifelong conservative, it really started bothering me. So I fought for the last 15 years to bring context, perspective, and balance to the stories that I anchored. Nowadays, the morning anchor is pretty much the main anchor at any station. We, sure. we have the most eyeballs, we bring it's in the really most money. It's really been a shift over it time. Been. The evening it's anchor really was the last the guy. 20 yeah. years. Yeah. And so, this was a great position that I gave up. I could have stayed there and died on that news set. But when Vicki decided to run for Roy Blunt's seat, mm -hmm. and things were kind of going crossways with me in the station because I was this conservative fighting from the inside, I thought, you know what? I have never done anything to serve my nation. And I know this is no way comparison to someone in this race who's actually taken the oath and, and served their country in the military. But I've got to do something. I've got to do something to save my country. The final straw was when President Biden deliberately left our people in Afghanistan and those who had supported us and left 13 U.S. servicemen to die at the airport in Kabul. I thought, that is it. I'm going to do something. I got with my wife. We prayed about it. We got a lot of uh, insight from friends and wise counsel. And she said to me, Scott, if you don't do this, I don't know who else is going to be able to be a stronger voice for the people. Tell folks about your wife. My wife's name is Leslie. We mm. met at a TV station in Waco, Texas. I took the job that she wanted. She was uh, wanting to be a reporter. She was a producer. She ended up producing some of the shows that I anchored and reported. We got married in 1989. We lived in West Palm Beach, moved back to Dallas, uh, where I was the political reporter for the CBS affiliate. Mm. Uh, covered uh, Ann Richards, um, <laughs> covered George W. Bush and his race for governorship and later the White House. And so I've always had this intrigue with politics, mm -hmm. but never wanted to really cross that line. I always tried to be fair and balanced and objective in the things that I presented. But I knew one thing, Scott, that the way that it was being presented in the media in general was not the full truth. My last day in October, I looked straight in that camera and I told folks, everything that I've done at this station has been for one thing, it's the truth, and the truth matters. So tell me about this wife that uh, gave you this conviction. The what? Your, this wife that told you you gotta do this. Uh, Leslie is an extreme, hardworking, she is the, you know how opposites attract, mm -hmm. all right? So I walked in and got this job at the CBS affiliate in Dallas, and. You know, I'm kind of a salesman at heart. I like talking to people. She's very nose to the grindstone. And she has just been the biggest supporter, the biggest constructive critique of my life and what I'm all about and what I need to be. But she's constantly, as I think partners in life should do, trying to improve one another. All right, now she's willing to uh, hike up and move? 
Yes. I always think when you're, you're yeah. in television, you naturally think of media markets, not political lines, right? right? So you're gonna, you're gonna, but you're gonna, you, you got a, you got a place picked out yet, or a county? Oh. Or? Yeah, this has been a big issue, and I understand mm. that. You know, under the U.S. Constitution, you don't have to live in the district in which you represent. You only have to live in the state. Well, in your life, you've thought of media markets, right? Exactly. We have moved yeah. around uh, from town to town and uh, moving up into better markets, better pay, we finally reach what I consider a pinnacle, being at some place for 23 years sure. and logging 23 and a half thousand hours on the air. But um, we're ready to make that move. In fact, uh, we uh, have contracted and cleared a, <coughs> cleared a lot already for a house in Cass County, mm -hmm. and we are leasing a house, uh, hopefully this coming weekend, uh, and will establish residency next week. I know that's a big deal sure. for the people of the 4th Congressional District. And if I'm going to be the strongest, loudest, most consistent, unwavering voice for conservative rule values, I need to live in the district. Everyone sure. who's in this race should live in the district. So you've got the place picked up. Yeah. Tell me what's the difference between you and some other folks. Sometimes in these primaries, yeah. everyone's pro-Trump, pro-life, yeah. pro-gun. Tell me what makes you different. There's a lot of great people in this race, and I'm friends with a couple. The difference between me and them is I'm not a politician. I don't want to be a politician. I've signed a pledge to support a constitutional amendment for term limits. Three terms in the House, two in the Senate. If it's good enough for the White House, it's good enough for the People's House. I came to this race because I wanted to make a difference and I wanted to be a voice for the people. I get asked a lot, Mark, what's, I got this asked today, what's your agenda? I don't have an agenda. My agenda is listening to people of the 4th Congressional District. And that's why we've been to 20 of the 24 county so far listening to the people we were waiting for this map to get finished thank goodness it finally got finished <laughs> they took their time yeah didn't they? and that's another thing about going back to my house real quick i would have bought a house a year ago in the district mm -hmm. but they wouldn't come up with a map and i'd be darned if i was going to buy a house in the cash County and get mapped out like that what leslie might not have appreciated right no no we had money to buy one house and make one time move. you got a great you got a great uh, district though i mean it does run you got the you got university of missouri Right there. Yeah. You've got right there in the in the area. You've got the state fair. You've got folks from Belton to you know Cass County folks. I mean, it is it is a great part of Missouri. It's very diverse. Um, the farms, ninety five thousand farms in the state of the Missouri. A, a vast mm -hmm. number of them in the fourth congressional district. My brother, brother in law, farms in Henry County and has cattle. Yep. And I we were just down there putting up signs and Clinton did a little rally down there at the gazebo. Oh, Shannon Cooper territory. That's then exactly you got this right. college here in Warrensburg. I mean, yeah. you, you've really got a, uh, it is a, it is a tremendous district. It's got almost more subsets of things that, that, that are impacted by the federal government than anybody. You, exactly. got the, you got the military bases. Two bases. I mean, there is a lot of things where this district needs the federal government. Can you go be, part of being that voice for rural Missouri isn't just railing about conservatism. Right. It's a few things the government does. A lot of them they do here, doing them well. It's standing up for what is inherently the makeup of the 4th mm -hmm. Congressional District. Whiteman Air Force Base, we've got to get this new bomber, the B-21 to Whiteman. We've got to add the protection to keep the um, respect alive for Whiteman and the great work that they've done over the decades. You know, the B, think about this. You and I are about the same age. You remember hearing about the stealth bomber when it first came out? Yeah. You know, that's 40 to 50 year old technology now. This new bomber that's coming on is <clears throat> gonna be even more um, advanced. Yeah. We got to make sure it's at Whiteman. Um, got to protect and bring home money for Fort Leonard Wood. But I think one of the biggest deals is we've got to get the EPA and the Justice Department off the back of our farmers. In five counties. How do you do it? In five, well, you do it by just getting a new administration in. You, you cut, cut their, their budget. budget. I mean, that's, I mean, right? You're well, never going to get them to leave folks alone unless you just make fewer of them to get folks, right? You're going to have to knock some heads yeah. by cutting the budget and getting them off the backs of our farmers who are trying to bring in great yields on our soybeans in five counties, including Bates, where they're protecting a little endangered beetle over farmers who want to produce for not just Missouri, not just for the United States, but the world now. I'm just a simple West Butler County hillbilly. You've been in Kansas City and, and probably interviewed far more prestigious folks than I have. I read Joe Biden as a good man, a man that means well, a nice person, probably probably wishes he had this job 20 years ago. And I know that you'll, if I hear some folks tell me gas prices aren't the president's purview, well, by George, I think the president should make it his purview. If you get elected, what can you do? I mean, folks are truly suffering. They are. Not just suffering of, I better go, I, be, I don't want to go to Colton's here in Warrensburg, I better go to McDonald's because the gas prices. They're like, I, what do I cut out? 
it is not a it's not lifestyle choices. I mean, it, it's serious and it's things getting for worse, Scott. The F-150 is a model of a truck. It shouldn't be what it costs to fill it up. And unfortunately, that's exactly what's happening with families having to make those tough choices. Fertilizer prices that have tripled and quadrupled. What do you do about it? You go in and you, you convince the people uh, that the president's wrong. We begin to have these investigations. I think in your district, they're convinced. Yeah, we are convinced. But America, that's what I'm talking about. You've got to convince Americans that the president is, is not only wrong, but he is gaslighting the American people. You cannot tell me that this is Putin's problem, that yeah. this is Putin's price hike. This is Biden's blunder. But this was he high came in and that, shut yeah. down the pipelines. He shut down oil drilling on federal lands. It just shocks me. He does not, see, he seems like a guy that, I, that has some sense. I, it shocks me if the fact is they're not giving permits to drill and they're shutting pipelines. If that's what you really believe, that's the and problem. And now he's going to go beg the Saudi Arabians for oil, get on his hands and knees and beg the Saudi Arabian government to produce more oil? Have you heard of anything more ridiculous? All right, so you're coming out of the far northwest corner of the district. Yeah. How are you going to win this? We are going to every district, as I said. We are shaking every hand. We are putting up signs. In well, now tell every, me this. Yes. Back, when, you were, when you were on television, Fox, how far out did, your, did that broadcast go? Did it go out to Odessa, Warrensburg? Where, all where all did it, it go? came out to Warrensburg. We okay. are right on the edge of it here mm -hmm. in Johnson County. Uh, it, it took in about 40% of the 4th Congressional District. Mm -hmm. which is handy and now we picked up Lafayette and Saline County which are also in our viewing area. Sure. So people when I go out to places people know me. People show up to hear it. Now, here's the difference. You can have good name recognition, which is great in a political race, but unless people like and respect you and and believe that you believe and are going to do something about what their concerns are, then that's not worth much. So now I am I am convincing people that I'm not just Mark Offered a guy who wore nice suits in Kansas City. I'm a guy who's just as comfortable in Wranglers and boots. I've owned a horse stable with 62 stalls, three riding arenas, and unlike the President of the United States, I know the difference between a whip and a rein. <laughs> and so I am... Yeah, my I'm, buddy Curtis Gregory tells me you can give a stem winder when you get worked <laughs> up. I, I really enjoy meeting the people. You know, over the years in, in television, we would go out and do things to promote the station. We'd shake a lot of hands. Sure. But it's a very two-dimensional relationship. Mm -hmm. I was selling a product, basically our news product, and trying to get more people to watch. And I would listen to what people had to say and their concerns. But now, it's, this is serious, Scott. I'm going out. I'm taking notes. I've filled up two of these books so far. Uh, we're doing videos on our cell phone, telling the stories. And that's what I'm going to do when we get to Washington. Tell the stories of rural Missouri in Washington and in the national media to get the respect the people deserve. Mark Alvin, thank you for joining us and sharing you. your views. Appreciate it. We'll be back to you next week from Bush Stadium for This Week in Missouri Politics. Support for this program has been provided by the Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, Ameren, Spire, and Sterling Bank.